I was just saying that because I'm a male, I can't multitask. So I can't time the speakers and listen to them at the same time. I can't walk and chew gum either at the same time. So um, Daniel here is going to uh, be our timer for the session. He's just going to stand up and look obvious when <laughs> there's a couple of minutes to go. Um, this session's on immunology, and we've got some really great speakers. And our first ones are sort of the dynamic duo over on the right here. So Professor Sonia marshall Gratisnik and Dr. Um, Professor Don Staines. And um, they're going to sort of play tag team, I think, in their talk. And they're going to be talking about immunological and calcium signaling for defining chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalomyelitis. They have uh, a strong immunological background where I'm ignorant about immunology, so I'm re really looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Thank you. Um, thank you again to the organisers for uh, inviting us to speak. Uh, the National Centre for Neuroimmunology is part of a consortium, the Consortium Health International for ME, uh, and the data that we're generating at the moment for publication is under the CHIME and CNED. Uh, the presentation I'm giving today, along with my colleague, is in terms of immunological and calcium signalling changes defined in ME CFS. At this point in time, I'd like to acknowledge... Uh, oops, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, colleagues and contributors uh, for these, this presentation. So if we look at the history of CFSME in relation to immunological research, the key characteristic that's been uh, evident in the literature is uh, CFSME is characterised by immune dysfunction. And our group, amongst others internationally, have shown there's consistent immunological changes and they are found consistently in ME-CFS patients. Now, what is the most consistent finding that has been reported has been natural killer cell function. And natural killer cells are part of the immune system and obviously the immune system is a model in which objective measures of cell function can be then tested and replicated. Now, when we look at natural killer cell function, um, there's some slides coming up and I'll explain that, um, we've shown that they're consistently impaired. However, the key feature of the reduction in natural killer cell function from group to group really hasn't been evaluated as um, a legitimate change uh, when we look at critically evaluating all of the group's research in these findings. So the paper that we we're just about to publish, we've done a systematic review and we reviewed uh, every NK cell function uh, research project that's been undertaken in CFSME um, to date. And what we have found, and we've done a number of other systematic reviews as well, which will be presented at the latter part of this presentation, we've actually demonstrated this is the um, consistent finding to utilise for uh, modelling any uh, changes that we're going to study with immune cells in ME-CFS. So this data here is just presenting uh, some of the projects that we evaluated through a systematic review and the year and obviously uh, what criteria was used in addition to which country it was done and then what type of findings uh, we uh, evaluated through this systematic review of all literature in this area and whether or not they met a quality assurance measure. If they didn't, they were obviously of poor value and this is uh, outlined in the publication coming out. So with that, we've got confidence after doing a thorough systematic review and evaluating everyone's research projects to date on NK cell function utilising natural killer cells and looking at their function as a model to replicate uh, functional changes in MECFS in other body systems is uh, a way forward. And when you look at natural killer cells, the, there are five particular phenotypes and natural killer cells have two predominant 
phenotypes, and they're illustrated in this actual uh, slide. They are the bright and dim. And as depicted here, oh, as depicted here, you can see, uh, these are the bright natural killer cells. And this is, um, they generate then obviously to these dim cells. You can see here that the bright cells are denoted by a specific cell marker called a CD56. Um, and then you can see over here, it, it actually lessens in expression on a cell surface where the predominant cell surface marker is known as a CD16. So hence, bright and dim cells in NK cells are defined by CD56 bright, CD50, uh, CD16 dim. Now, the evolution or the development of these natural killer cells from bright to dim is governed by um, predominantly calcium. Now, if we look at this um, slide here, natural killer cell function, well, if we look at the actual uh, outline of a natural killer cell here, this is the dim cell, this is the bright cell, we can then actually look at the, the genetic makeup of these cells in terms of the DNA. And we can actually then look at the particular uh, genetic sequence down to the base pair of um, this particular natural killer cell. And when we look at the cell, the DNA that makes up this actual natural killer cell is each receptor, it's within the cell, it can be the particular organelles located in the cell, it can be a number of key um, organelles located within uh, a natural killer cell. And this diagram here then shows, well, obviously the DNA, we're looking at receptors denoted here, and then we're also looking at particular pathways, calcium signaling pathways, in each of these particular natural killer cells. And then predominantly what we're going to measure then is the function of this natural killer cell, denoted here as lysis of the target cell. So in an individual, uh, a natural killer cell's functions to kill or lyse uh, tumour infected cells or virus infected cells. And lysing means effectively the natural killer cell docks onto this particular pathogen, virus infected cell, and it basically then harpoons it, which I'll explain in some slides coming up. And it harpoons it and then basically then transports a number of proteins across into the actual um, infected cell and it splits it apart or causes cell death in that infected cell, hence the term lysis. So, if you look at natural killer cells, well, there's been an array of literature that has presented there's been changes in natural killer cell function. But when we look at the literature, it doesn't actually compare whether or not there's a change in um, CFSME patient severity. Does the severity give it, govern a change in natural killer cell function? And what we published is the first to demonstrate this. And there was a significant, as represented here on this slide, this is a severe CFS cohort, moderate CFS cohort and control. And this is the percent lysis represented here on the y-axis. There was a significant difference shown between severity for CFSME from severe to moderate uh, CFS patients compared to the healthy control. And since then, we've reproduced this result. So, we then thought, well, as Cara touched on at the beginning of her talk, she said she's taken a snapshot of uh, the research data she's generated. At one point in time, she's representing changes or no changes in the data she was uh, looking at. Now, what we have demonstrated for the first time is we've monitored patients over a longitudinal time point. We measured them at baseline, at a snapshot, then we did it at six months, 12 months, 18 months, out to 24 months, and then again at 36 months. And so we've consistently followed um, CFSME patients. And what we have found, and this is just an example of this data, is this is 0, 6 and 12 months, and there was a significant uh, reduction in NK cell function for CFSME patients over time. So just as a snapshot represents uh, significant changes, we've actually tracked this longitudinally and demonstrated in the same cohort there is this consistent finding. So I guess if you're 
looking at, well, there's a reduction in natural killer cell function, you think, well, what's upstream of that? And that diagram I showed you, the lysis or the killing, that's a consistent finding, but what's actually happening internally within the cell? Is it something um, within the cell that's governing this dysfunction? So what we set out to do was work backwards from the lysis and say, well, are there particular particular mediators of the function of natural killer cells and are they different compared to healthy controls? And importantly, we wanted to look at particular proteins and also uh, particular molecules and receptors on the cell surface and with inside the natural killer cell to see if this was having uh, an actual outcome of affecting the overall function of the cell. And particularly, we started working in the last probably two and a half years looking at calcium as a potential, um, well, a potential problem that might be affecting natural killer cell function because lysis or the killing function of the natural killer cell ultimately is governed by the end pathway and it relies on calcium to mediate that function. So we thought, well, if it's happening at the very end of the function, which is re requiring calcium, Obviously, it might be upstream that these are also uh, calcium-regulated mechanisms that may be also being affected. So what we um, focused on here, and I'll just take you through this diagram, is if you look here, this is the target cell and This is the target cell here, and we have here is the um, antigen on the target cell that's going to be uh, recognised by this cell surface receptor, in this instance CD16, as I spoke about at the start of this presentation. It's recognised as being obviously non-self, this antigen expressed on the target cell. The natural killer cell binds to this target cell through the CD16 receptor, and that then introduces a whole cascade of intracellular signaling mechanisms. Now, they're phosphorylated, and what you can see here at the very end is these two pathways here, known as Merck and ERK1 and 2. They're part of the MAP kinase pathways, and importantly, what you see is this ERK1-2 requires calcium as the final cofactor to initiate then um, the lysis of the target cell as represented here. Now what you see are these little rods and actual little dots. These are the proteins or the molecules produced by the natural killer cell to initiate lysis. And they harpoon, obviously, across into the target cell as represented here, and then they induce lysis or apoptosis as it's also known, cell death. Now, when we looked at these particular pathways, what you see is we focused on the particular calcium pathways. Some of the data I'm presenting today clearly shows that there are changes in these cell pathways that require calcium. Um, there is other data, obviously due to the length of the talk we are unable to present, but we have done a, 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 gene, a gene analysis of those calcium sensitive enzymes and that was published last year demonstrating there were uh, significant changes in those calcium sensitive intracellular signaling pathways and enzymatic pathways uh, in cal uh, natural killer cells of CFSME patients. Importantly, when I draw your attention back to this area of the intracellular signaling pathway, phospholipase C is important um, with this intracellular cascade. After the phosphorylation, it initiates another, another uh, pathway called the IP3 receptor pathway, which then opens up another portal on the natural killer cell surface, and they're crack channels, they're known as. Now, these crack channels initiate more calcium to come inside the cell. The rationale for that is the cell's requiring more calcium. It's requiring more calcium for, first and foremost, this pathway here, to cause, and you might see this as, oh, just a line, these actual microtubules, but they actually act in myosin filaments and they require ATP to initiate then the translocation of these particular proteins um, to the cell surface to then harpoon and then lyse the target cell.
And of course, Paul spoke about the ATP phenomena and the ATPA synthase as um, results that he's shown uh, this morning. So if we look at uh, the data we've generated from looking at these studies, what we found, this was the first study and there's others, um, we look at the proteins that are responsible for the harpooning and obviously the killing or the apoptosis of the target cell. What we see here is there was no significant difference in these two particular proteins measured. Uh, this is the, the, the pore or the harpoon pore called the perforin protein. And this is a, a, an, an enzyme or a protein that is harpooned across into the target cell called granzyme A. Now, what you see here is granzyme B. There was a significant reduction in granzyme B. The important component um, in relation to granzyme B is it's the major protein um, expressed when we have this apoptotic mechanism. And in addition to that, granzyme B is uh, very fundamentally governed by calcium as a cofactor to, to initiate transcription of the protein that then obviously is granzyme B. Now, what we further looked at was uh, whether or not any receptors on the cell surface of uh, the natural killer cell were actually um, governing the, the dysfunction of the natural killer cell lysis. And we undertook this study um, two years ago to say, well, are there particular receptors? And when I showed you the diagram of the natural killer cell recognising the infected tumour cell. They're via receptors called KERS or killer immunoglobulin receptors. And we undertook this study to say, well, are there actual defects on the KER receptors that can't recognise the infected cell uh, through these immunological uh, receptors? And this research um, we undertook looked at every cur located on the cell of natural killer cells, both in CFSMA patients, represented here in the black, versus healthy controls in the grey. And there was no significant difference whether they were activating killer immunoglobulin receptors or inhibitory cur, cur receptors. So we had confidence then to say, well, it's not actually uh, a cur anomaly we're finding. It's potentially uh, related to receptors that are calcium-mediating mechanisms within the cell. And how we undertook that hypothesis-driven research was to look at whether or not there are any uh, governing, regulating mechanisms, and these are called microRNA, or MER for short. And we did this study also looking at particular calcium-mediated MER um, indices, and what we found were a number of calcium-sensitive MERs were down-regulating, suggesting that there was lower levels of calcium in the cell, as represented by this slide and subsequently this slide. And we have actually reproduced this, but it was under a patent, and, uh, and of course what has happened, universities look at the amount of cost to generate it as a patent and whether or not this thing can relate to um, translating across not only nationally but internationally, and anyone that's worked with MERS or microRNAs knows the degradation associated issues with MERS, so hence um, that patent is still in process, but we have potentially another one. So if I just recount what we've done thus far, we've looked at natural killer cell function and demonstrated consistently that it's reduced in CFSME patients. We have then further looked at whether or not there are mechanisms um, related to calcium that are responsible for uh, producing particular molecules such as granzymes and perforin to cause a reduction in uh, the lysis component for these cells. And we've reported granzyme B, which is a calcium sensitive protein, is significantly lower. Now, other, other receptors we've looked at have also calcium capability, that is transferring calcium inside the cell to initiate cell function. And we undertook a, a study that looked at further validating the calcium uh, component potentially associated with CFSME and the pathology of that through a particular family called the ion channel receptors. And these are trip channels as they're known for, um, 
in abbreviated form, and that's a transient receptor iron potential receptor family. They're 28 in configuration, but within the 28 families, they also have subtypes. So, for example, uh, the one I'm about to show you, TRIPM3, it has 12 isotypes. And they don't just form one particular isotype. For example, TRIPM3 alpha 1 can then form with TRIPM3 alpha 2, 5, and 7. And they make heteromers and dimers. So the complexity of these trip channels uh, is phenomenal. And I guess it's about unraveling the puzzle. And we're, we're working towards a very solid unraveling of the puzzle, but obviously that takes time. So first and foremost, to look at whether or not there are any genetic changes, like we had done with the Kerr receptors, we undertook the same approach here, where we looked at the uh, genetic differences, if at all, between CFSME patients with another calcium channel, and that was the trip channels in this instance. Now, why would we look at those trip channels? Well, trip channels are divided into six predominant channels, as represented here, but the important component of trip channels are they are the most ancient receptor family, and they actually initiate and sense threats. And they set, sense threats virtually throughout the entire body. And when you look at trips, oops, there is a particular, um, a particular mechanism that they initiate, and that is it's calcium mediated. They bring calcium inside the cells, whether the cells are located, for example, in the brain, on the respiratory centres, they're located cardiovascularly, on the skeletal muscle, um, they're also located in the endocrine and immune, and as well as the circulatory system. Now, what happens for them to be activated on those uh, organ systems is through threats. And the threats here are represented here on the left-hand side. So osmotic pressure is a, a, a threat that initiates these trip channels, stretch vibration. I use the word stretch in the context of if you have um, torsion, for example, exercise, uh, these threat receptors are initiated. And their response with uh, the actual uh, mechanism of stretch results with calcium coming inside the cell. So I'll use uh, an analogy. If you have uh, an exercising muscle, the response is to bring calcium inside the cell to initiate ATP for energy and muscle contraction through the, the heavy and light filament. If you are a CFS patient, obviously that's perceived as a threat. If you may have changes in these particular iron channels, you potentially have dysfunction of these channels, which allows less calcium to be mobilised inside a contracting muscle cell. Obviously, that then manifests with changes in intracellular muscle contraction of that muscle cell, the myocyte, and that may cause fusion and pain sensation because these receptors are pain sensation receptors as well. They're also temperature sensitive receptors and they also respond to xenobiotics, allergens, uh, irritants, and they're in actually uh, initiated through um, capsaicin, uh, the active component of chili. Now, once you have these threats as initiated here and identified on this side of the slide, you have the activation of the receptor, the trip receptor, and it's actually the six membrane bound um, iron channel. And the calcium moves through uh, the, the iron channel at locations four and five of the channel. It causes intracellular signaling, uh, and then it, that initiates obviously cell, cell function. So in the instance, I'll use the example of Paul and Cara today. The requirement for calcium once it comes inside the cell, whether it's a muscle, etc., or if it's a natural killer cell, requires calcium and for a muscle, that means then it has to have muscle contraction that requires calcium through um, the mitochondrial membrane. Now these receptors are also located on the cell surface of the mitochondria, as well as the endoplasmic reticulum and other organelles within the cell. So, Going back to the hypothesis of, well, if we have changes in calcium uh, cell signalling, 
and we wanted to look at particular iron channels which bring calcium inside the cell. We looked at the genes that are potentially going to be different or associated with CFSME patients for trip channels. And this study was published in 2016 where we identified um, a, a number of genes, particularly trip genes, uh, that were significantly associated with CFSME patients compared to healthy controls. We've reproduced this again, but again, it's under patent, so it's not published. Um, now, if we look here, this particular receptor here, the TRIP-M3, is highlighted and circled, and there's a reason for that. And obviously, technology works very fast, but technology doesn't want to work as fast as scientists sometimes work. And in this instance, the TRIP-M3 that's uh, the data we found, it's the only actual TRIP uh, receptor that we could measure uh, on the cell surface of a natural killer cell. Now you might say, well, why is that? Well, as I showed you, the TRIP channel has like a six membrane bound um, structure. And when you try and tag uh, a receptor that doesn't actually have the capability just to be tagged on the cell surface, it means it can move through the cell and subsequently it will bind onto other intracellular signaling or organelles in the cell. And that gives a false positive. So therefore, um, we were lucky enough to have this actual trip channel come up significantly associated with CFSME patients. And it was just so lucky that the technology that we wanted to employ uh, only was able to have a, a cell surface marker for trip M3. So we move forward in looking at could we identify for the first time trip M3 on the cell surface of natural killer cells in healthy patients? And no one had done that in the world to begin with. So we had to obviously quantify and um, quality assure that that was able to be achieved in healthy controls before we could then move forward to check to see if there were any differences in uh, CFS patients compared to healthy controls for this receptor. And the data that's presented here clearly shows that there's a significant reduction. Uh, on the Y, you have the trip m 3 expression, and this is in percentage, and it's also shown in absolute cell count numbers. Uh, quantified here through flow cytometric analysis. And what you can see, there's a significant reduction in the bright, and this was um, 0.06, so approaching significance, uh, for the CFSME patients as well as for the DIM. And it's suggesting, obviously, because you need calcium for uh, the generation of a cell from going from bright to DIM, there was potentially an impact um, on, on the cell surface expression, first of all, of um, NK cells for healthy controls and then when we compared it to CFSME patients it was obviously lower in CFSME patients which is a, a pivotal finding. So what we did then was uh, last year, this is still ongoing but this is a, a representation of the data we're doing at the moment, we thought well we're looking at this uh, from a natural killer cell, reduced expression of trip M3 on the cell surface, we're finding that in CFSME patients compared to controls, why not replicate it in another site? Because we've got low level of expression on NK cells for trip M3, why not test that theory and see if it's representative at another site? Now we know trip M3 is expressed on the gastrointestinal tract and for that reason we undertook a number of biopsies and we continue to collect and thus far we have the same results representative for CFSME patients uh, compared to control. So I draw your attention to this is the negative control for healthy control versus CFSME just to make sure you're doing the experiment right. And what you see here is this is trip M3 expression on the gastrointestinal tract from a healthy control. In contrast, what you see here is a CFSME patient that has significantly reduced uh, trip M3 expression in the gastrointestinal tract. So the representation of a reduction, a significant reduction in trip M3 expression of, um, in the natural killer cell is also being replicated uh, in the gastrointestinal tract of CFSME patients. So if we look at um, the effect of reduced expression of trip M3 on the cell surface, 
and we then want to say, well, what happens intracellularly? What's the signalling uh, cascade mechanism that may be impacted? We thought, well, let's look at these intracellular signalling cascade pathways that rely on calcium. And I draw your attention back to this slide where we started to focus on Merck 1 and 2 and ERK 1 and 2. And what we found, and this is the interesting part, we look at Merck, which is, I draw your attention uh, to the top slide here, and this is the unstimulated versus challenge. So we wanted to see when you challenge the natural killer cell, does it behave in the intracellular signaling pathway, which requires calcium to form its function, does it act uh, differently, either increasing? We hypothesised it would because it, it has calcium as a requirement, but um, if, it, if it's not going to work correctly, it'll probably increase. And what we found was it significantly did increase when we challenged it in an array of environmental factors. This is real data obtained from the CFSME patients. This is the histogram plots we get from quantifying these responses, intracellular signaling pathways through flow cytometric analysis, and we clearly showed it was significantly increased. We've reproduced this data too. Conversely, because the last part of the intracellular signaling pathway requires calcium as a significant cofactor to increase cell lysis when challenged um, with a target infected cell or a virus infected cell. We looked to see um, what the expression of those signaling pathways would have with our CFSME patients. We anticipated, well, if there's low levels of calcium coming into the cell, then this pathway, which requires the greatest amount of calcium to initiate lysis, we hypothesised that it would be significantly reduced. And again, when we challenged the cell, that is the natural killer cell, our hypothesis was proven correct, showing a significant reduction in uh, ERK-1-2, which is a calcium-required pathway. So we then hypothesised, well, if we think there's low levels of calcium being utilised in the intracellular signalling pathway. What's the actual effect on um, the amount of calcium located inside the cell and conversely, what is being stored? What is being stored in the endoplasmic reticulum for a rainy day? What amount of calcium is being stored there? And what we found as represented by this slide here, we found the, the amount of calcium located inside the cytoplasm represented here when stimulating a particular receptor of focus that was the TRIP-M3, there was a significant reduction in the amount of calcium coming inside the cell. And finally then we were like, well, what's the amount of calcium if there's low levels of it being located inside the cell, how much is being stored in the endoplasmic reticulum for a rainy day, for example, when you need a muscle contraction. And again, what we found was there was a significant reduction in the amount of storage of calcium coming, um, being available for the cell to use for a rainy day. So I guess, in, in essence, our hypothesis for the last two and a half years has been working in the field of receptor function and how calcium is potentially a mediator for the pathology of CFSME. Um, at this point in time, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague and he's going to speak about the latest results. We have results being published soon, uh, replicating the data we're about to report on, as well as um, further data we're looking at with pharmacotherapeutic interventions. Don. Thank you, Sonia. <clears throat> um, one of the questions I'll be putting to you shortly is what is the story that we're seeing here? Now, uh, to summarise, we know that the TRIP-M3 receptor, along with other TRIPs, uh, is located uh, ubiquitously around the body, more in some organ systems than others. But shortly I'll invite you to say, well, what are the consequences of, of this going wrong? And I'd like you to put in your mind's eye what would be the clinical manifestations of that, that, that is the illness CFSME that we know. Now, in this uh, slide, um, 
what we're doing here is looking, uh, is firstly stating the fact that TRIP-M3 uh, is expressed in normal natural killer cells. It's expressed in many cells of the body, but there is a reduced expression of it in NK cells with people uh, with CFSME. Now, <clears throat> there is a, um, a substance within the, the body called pregnenolone sulfate, which is the natural ligand or agonist for TRIP-M3. In other words, when uh, the receptor is exposed to pregnenolone sulfite, uh, it's, it's one of the um, uh, naturally occurring hormones in the body, then the TRIP-M3 uh, ion channel would normally respond in the appropriate way to respond to threat, along with the other uh, TRIP receptors known, known as, threat recept uh, as threat receptors. And what we see in the slide here is that uh, in the control, there's an expression um, of um, uh, the response to, um, uh, well, the, the, the normal situation of how, um, how the um, body responds with TRIP-M3 uh, compared to um, CFSME in terms of, of its uh, expression. And here is that exposure to pregnenolone sulphate uh, that I mentioned. And you can see that there is a uh, significant reduction in the um, uh, TRIP-M3 expression by patients. However, in the healthy controls, the dark shaded areas, uh, there is an increase in expression, as you would expect. It, it's responding uh, in the normal way. So the, the really top end gold standard way of measuring ion channel function in cells is through a technique called patch clamp or electrophysiology. And what this does is it, it examines um, each cell by putting, as the name suggests, a clamp of a micro pipette, very, very tiny, over the surface of the cell where you've identified that ion channel uh, as existing through tagging uh, and whatever. And then you can measure the electrical current between the outside and the inside of the cell, very, very tiny currents. Remember, these are not... Uh, normally excitable cells compared to, uh, to neurons. So this is very, very tricky stuff. And by putting that pipette over that particular patch, which is where the name comes from, uh, you can then not only measure uh, the electrical current that's generated through the calcium ions in their, in their flow, but by adding different drugs to the, to the bath in which that's located, you can then look at any changes. So in effect, you're looking at a... Um, uh, an early form of let's do some drug testing here uh, before you get into um, uh, clinical trials in, in patients. And by measuring those responses to the drugs, uh, you can then see whether you're getting uh, promoted function or impaired function. So here we have <clears throat> the, uh, a slide that shows uh, healthy controls and what the uh, response is um, to the uh, TRIP-M3 pharmaceutical uh, stimulation. And if you look at the line at the bottom, you can see around about this point here, uh, that's your basal recording here, when you add pregnenolone sulphate, you can see a very healthy response, okay? So the increase in gradient there shows a very robust, healthy, normal response to the natural ligand or agonist of TRIP-M3 known as pregnenolone sulphate. And then at this point here, we put an inhibitor of that process called onanetin. And in a normal uh, cell, in a, in a healthy individual, then that would be impaired and it would show signs of impairment, and that's exactly what happens here. When you add the inhibitor onanetin, then you get a decline in the function. That's totally normal, totally predicted, as, as you would expect. However, when you look at CFSME patients, I'll draw your attention, first of all, to this looks very, very fuzzy compared to the previous slide, and that's because the recordings are so much less that you actually have to amplify it more to, uh, to see the effect that's being given. So already we know that that effect uh, is impaired, so the baseline is impaired. And when we add the pregnenolone sulphate, really not much happens at all, right? That's kind of virtually a baseline until you add other stimulants here, which then give a more robust uh, response, saying that, yes, using other stimulants, uh, you can get a more robust response. But really, the response uh, here of TRIP-M3 
in um, uh, patients, CFSME patients, is really quite, quite flat. And that's a very, very important finding. So here's um, uh, another data that we have. A uh, slightly different interpretation. Uh, here in the healthy control, you can see the baseline here, and that's just the ordinary signal that's being uh, picked up. Um, and when you apply the uh, pregnenolone sulfate, then you see a very clear stimulus response. So um, here in the, in the healthy control, uh, this is exactly the response that you would, uh, you would expect to see. However, in patients, again, almost a flat line. There is just no response. There's virtually uh, no background to TRIP-M3 function, and uh, that's the baseline there. And then when you add pregnenolone sulphate, absolutely nothing happens. So in other words, these are non-responsive channels in the cells of patients with CFSME. And that's really stating that. And then using the inhibitor uh, on an eaten. Again, when you use pregnenolone sulfate in the healthy controls, a very robust response. And then this is just doing the same experiment in a different way by adding pregnenolone sulfate with on an eaten, the inhibitor. Then you get exactly the response you would predict, which is an impairment of an otherwise healthy response. But in CFSME patients, again, identical findings that there is just a flat line. So that when in the patients you add pregnenolone sulphate, very, very little response, as we mentioned before. And when you add uh, pregnenolone sulphate with onanetum, expecting to see an impaired function, there's virtually no difference between the two, indicating a very, very flat line, non-responsive uh, ion channel. So just to summarise, TRIP-M3 activity is impaired in NK cells from ME-CFS uh, patients and their expression is reduced. Um, the preg pregnenolone sulphate response, which is normally quite robust um, in uh, healthy controls, is significantly lower in people with ME-CFS. And uh, the ionic currents in the patients were also resistant to onanetum in the presence of pregnenolone sulphate. In other words, the type of responses you would expect to find are, are simply not, um, well, in the healthy patient that you would expect, are just not there in, uh, in uh, um, patients with CFSME. <clears throat> so this is the part where I'm going to invite you to think about what the clinical manifestations of this illness might be. We know that TRIP-M3 uh, is ubiquitously distributed, but it has very uh, highly concentrated um, representation in a number of tissues. So let's just walk through those. White matter of the CNS, particularly the brain and spinal cord. Now, as I mentioned, uh, neurons are excitable cells. They respond in quite different ways. They had different types of uh, calcium channels to promote uh, stimuli and responses, known as voltage-gated channels. Uh, but in, um, in this respect, Glial cells, or from the word, um, uh, the Greek meaning glue, were always thought to be just cells that held the neurons together so that they could do their job. And nothing could be further from the truth. Glial cells are incredibly important for a whole range of housekeeping functions, homeostasis, keeping a whole lot of balance uh, responses correct. And they, the TRIP-M3 is highly located in, in the white matter of the brain and spinal cord. And in this respect, being non-excitable non cells, they uh, have a certain amount of similarity to, to NK cells, which generally are regarded as non-excitable cells as well. Very high concentrations in the eye. The iris, the retina, and, uh, and the optic nerve. Now, patients with CFSME describe a lot of eye pain. They describe difficulty with accommodation and focusing, um, maybe even blurred vision. Um, that's one to, to just hold on to for a moment. The trigeminal and ciliary ganglia, uh, located um, in the forward part of the brain, um, you would see that the symptoms that patients get can include trigeminal neuralgia and uh, other uh, symptoms around um, eye and facial uh, pain and, and responses. They're also located in the in the pancreas, and I've just put one asterisk here, uh, because they help to co-regulate insulin. 
Now, patients often describe the phenomenon known as a crash. So if they haven't eaten a certain amount of food or the right food or frequently enough, uh, then they'll go into a very rapid decline and they may stay that way for many hours or even days. So there's a working hypothesis here that um, pancreatic insulin regulation is very important in, in patients. Not a lot of publications in this area just yet, uh, but we expect we'll see more uh, about that. And as Sonia indicated, uh, the gastrointestinal tract, uh, a very, very profound image of uh, decreased expression of uh, trip M3 in the gut in, in patients. <clears throat> and with the eye of faith, you could also see some disassembly of, uh, of the architecture of the cells um, in the, the tissue of the gut. So there's, uh, there's more to this story, but the fact that there is uh, a decreased expression of the receptor, and as we've seen from the electrophysiology, uh, uh, impaired function of the receptor, and you consider this to be in every tissue in the body, and including the cardiovascular system, there is a very global picture here of multi-system impairment. I might just mention in passing acetylcholine. Um, acetylcholine is very expensive, very um, uh, highly distributed around the body, as you know, the neuromuscular junction. It's um, uh, used in the autonomic nervous system and the preganglionic uh, areas and in postganglionic parasympathetic system. But acetylcholine has uh, a number of what are called muscarinic uh, and nicotinic uh, receptors. That's just part of the uh, nomenclature they've derived. The muscarinic's number one to five, mostly one to three uh, in, in humans, and the muscarinic M1 receptor is physically bound to the trip M3 receptor. So it's joined, if you like, anatomically and functionally to the trip M3 receptor. So you could speculate that uh, muscarinic acetylcholine receptors of, um, that are joined in function with the, trip a the impaired trip M3 ion channel could well be impaired themselves. So those attributes where you require acetylcholine to function, neuromuscular junction and skeletal muscular function in the autonomic nervous system, and don't forget that acetylcholine is a major transmitter within the brain itself. So there is potential here for significant compromise, not just only of trip M3, but of acetylcholine function as well. <clears throat> so um, just a couple of closing remarks. We have other data which is uh, under publication showing that other channels uh, are also affected. Uh, and interestingly, not only necessarily negatively, but often uh, po possibly positively as well that there is some attempt uh, in homeostasis to restore the loss of function of, uh, of trip M3. Um, so there's quite a compelling story here. And just to follow the point uh, about um, what's upstream and what's downstream, um, there's been a certain amount of emphasis on cytokine studies in CFSME. And you've got to look somewhat uh, as though cytokines are a bit like the wake of a ship. Uh, you can tell it's been there, but you can't really say anything about the ship. And those data are, are somewhat inconsistent. Uh, we've done a systematic review uh, of the data, and in brief, uh, we, would have to, we came to the conclusion uh, there's really limited evidence to support the pathomechanism of the illness based on cytokines. There may be more discussion about that. Um, so we would like to leave you with the thought that this could be the primary pathology of the illness. Uh, just to very briefly uh, summarise, the question we had earlier in the day was what, um, how does this get initiated in patients? Why does it happen? So there's clearly genetic susceptibility and clearly there has been exposure to threats. And in clinical practice, I'm sure the clinicians here would recognise that many patients have either um, significant infections in the past, they've had an incredibly high exercise workload, I've seen patients who you know, would do rowing training four days a week, football tra training five nights a week, marathon training all weekend. So there's, a, in effect, a um, supranormal exposure to threat uh, which would be activating these receptors. And uh, if you have impaired function of one of those receptors or 
uh, an increased expression of abnormal types, and so they're not functioning correctly, and that they have other links with the acetylcholine system and so on, uh, then you've got a picture here developing of how an accumulation of threats built upon a background of uh, genetic susceptibility to the illness, at some point an infection happens which just exceeds the threat capacity level and the patient goes into the clinical manifestations of the illness. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all the, uh, the team um, and uh, a number of the um, uh, researchers uh, who are getting into patch clamp electrophysiology and a range of other um, uh, studies uh, have done truly remarkable work. Uh, we'd like to thank and acknowledge our donors and uh, generous supporters, without whom this work could not have been done. Sonia, if you should have any other closing comments. Okay, so at that point, uh, we should uh, close. Uh, thank you and invite any questions. So um, if you look at it statistically, association is probably the weak statistical analysis you could undertake. Um, we don't do that. We move forward in um, looking at repeated measures analysis or ANOVAs or multi-ANOVA multi, um, measures. So uh, we have shown clinically that if you're, the severity of the illness is governed by then a significant reduction using those higher statistical analysis for reduced NK cell function. And then in addition to that, for example, you, you touched on um, IL... Oh, just yeah. So interferon gamma would be the predominant one that you would look for um, with uh, NK cell function. And we've shown, yes, changes in interfer significant changes in interferon gamma using um, those statistical analysis with severity of the illness. NK function is significantly reduced. And, and it's higher, and the rationale for that is when you look at interferon gamma, it's um, like a pro-inflammatory component. And with these receptors, because they're threats and low calcium not being mobilised as effectively inside the cell, the data I showed in terms of those calcium-sensitive pathways, Merck 1, 2, ERK 1, 2, they're the predominant functional components of NK cell lysis. In contrast, if you look at the um, interferon gamma P38 pathways, they're the reactive oxygen or the pro-inflammatory pathways. And the data I showed, I didn't outline, but there's a significant increase in those pro-inflammatory pathways, and that then correlates to then um, the significant increase we've measured with the production of cytokines in those patients. Did I answer your question? In patients. in patients, whereas normally it will respond well yeah. in healthy controls. And we also know that um, the toll receptors and the calcitriol receptors on the nucleus, which have been long-term preserved, the pathogens have got patches against them. So we know that we can block the vitamin D receptor on the nucleus, which prevents your ants and mitochondria from coming yeah. out. My question is, have you considered um, a pathogen-based Um, I think we should take that as a question on notice because that's a, a next few steps that we would have to do, but Sonia may want to make a comment. I think first and foremost you have to demonstrate there's dysfunction in receptors before you can then sort of leap forward to anticipate that those responses would be mirrored. Um, 
And I guess we're very cautious. Um, we'd hate to see errors that were repeated in the past be repeated in the future with CFSME research. So on that basis, we take a considered approach. It is very hypothesis driven. Yes, um, that might be an angle, but I would hate to think that I'm convinced of that literature at the moment um, that could be applicable for those CFSME patients. So um, in the literature, um, you can see uh, there's particular parts of the trip M3 if we focus on that, because um, that's part of the research. Uh, the the trip M3 is that six membrane bound receptor, and where the calcium moves in is called the ICF region, um, the indispensable um, channel fragment. Where we've identified um, those fragments are uh, located predominantly in that area as well as just upstream. And when you look at the Nature Genetics paper on what is the rationale for exons, introns, and missense mutations, or um, the impact then on the functional component of receptors, the literature published in Nature now says that whether it's an intron or an entron, um, if it's in the three prime area, um, that's the leader sequence, it still has an impact then on the actual genetics well, or, or the function of, um, of the actual receptor. So those days of saying junk DNA or junk um, exon intron components are no longer from the nature paper accepted. Uh, you're actually raised two questions. Um, I can't speak to the patents issue, but in I think what you may be addressing is clinical phenotype. In other words, some patients will be more, say, a cardiovascular presentation. Uh, some will have um, yeah, more neurological. I mean, yes, we still work from case definitions, but uh, you must remember the case definitions at the moment are primarily symptom-based. Now, in public health medicine, uh, you would have to appreciate that the gold standard is to have a positive laboratory test in a clinically compatible illness. That is the gold standard. And this has been the bugbear of this uh, illness for so many decades. Uh, it's about getting a positive laboratory test and that's why that is such a vital uh, element. But the case definitions do allow for some variability. And we think that those differences in phenotype, which is what that says, uh, could well be due to the subtle differences in the trip receptors and other consequences that we are already beginning to identify. So, uh, look, it's a really good question because I think what that says is we have to be mindful of phenotypes. Uh, some people are going to get POTS, for example, and others won't or don't appear to, uh, and other sort of subtle differences in um, manifestations of the clinical illness as well. Um, thank you for a great talk. I was interested um, in the studies you presented really early on um, where you differentiated the clinical severity of the patients from mild to moderate to severe. I wonder if you could just go into a bit more detail about um, firstly how they're differentiated um, and second of all it was great that you've got that longitudinal data, fantastic. Um, how do you track patients that might change severity groups over yeah. time because we know that um, the severity can go up and down. So did you see patients move from a moderate to severe or vice versa? So um, in reference to your first question, can you just repeat that because I was just comprehending. Sorry, um, yeah. it was your patients were, I think it was from your 2011 yeah, severity. studies. Yeah, yep. mild, moderate, yep. severe and I think you had um, mobility versus yep. bed bound. Yes, then correct. Was that in severe or, yeah, just yep. wanted to get a bit of detail about those. Yeah, so um, we have, um, it's a three tier questionnaire. It, first and foremost, um, we have it that patients meet, obviously the FACUDA CDC, then we have embedded on this online questionnaire, they meet then the CCC, the Canadian Consensus Criteria, and then we've also got the ICC also embedded into the criteria. So we can stratify out patients, whether they meet all three, two, or only one, 
one. Now, on top of that, then we actually implement um, internationally validated questionnaires for, and we do this for every study, and they are, for example, the World Health Organization Disability Assessment Questionnaire, the WHODAS, well, very well validated in excess of, I think, 60,000 people. Um, then we have the fatigue severity scale. Then we have the Bell's, um, Bell's uh, performance um, fatigue scale. And then we have a, another one. So we have these consistently with every patient all evaluated and then we're able to assess them through an independent person uh, or whether they, what they meet in the severity. Um, on top of then the, um, the three-tier questionnaire as well. And then in terms of do we monitor them for how they peak and trough, as you say, we do monitor them, but when they are troughing, it's really hard because then we go out to their house and then they are unable to then provide a sample. So we have this wonderful clinical data that's online real time and we can see it then we actually have to go back and say, do you mind if we take a blood sample? And quite honestly, ethically, if they're not well, that's, that's where we stand. We won't induce harm. So sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. But we can see a significant change in the function. So we'll have to stop there and move on to the next speaker. But thank you very much. I had some questions myself, but I'll ask <laughs> you later. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>